when it first happened. The minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, victims' names were read, survivors tried to pick up the pieces, over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember. Join me now for the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Welcome to St. Paul's Church Online. We're so glad that you're here. And as you're joining us online, we hope that you'll also go to our website at stpauls.faith and click the Connect With Us button. Or you can just scan the QR code on the screen right here with your mobile device. However you decide to get there, this is an important uh, tool that we can use to connect with you. You can certainly share any contact information that you're willing to share with us. But more importantly, this is how you can submit a prayer request to the church. We'd love to know how to pray for you this week, and we hope that you'll join us there. As we continue our worship together, we would love to tell you more about North Star Initiative. North Star is our mission focus for the month of September, and we have a short video that we'd like to share with you right now. Janelle Espenshade here, Director of Development at North Star Initiative. You're going to be hearing from some of our survivors share about human trafficking and just what the Harbor Program can do for survivors who have been trafficked and some who have been trafficked locally right here in Lancaster County. Women rescued from sex trafficking are often misidentified as willing participants rather than as victims. Those fortunate enough to escape find they are not truly free. Many have been rejected by their families, and restorative care options are scarce. Without a home, job, education, or support system, the women have little hope for the future, and most will return to the streets to be re-victimized. Sex trafficking survivors are among the most complex of crime victims. Survivors require a multidisciplinary approach to address their severe physical and emotional trauma. Emergency and other temporary shelters are simply not designed to address their needs. North Star Initiative supports women who are survivors of domestic sex trafficking by providing physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual care through a Christ Center focus. Survivors arrive at the harbor with literally nothing. Survivors have the opportunity to rest and heal from their trauma while receiving individualized treatment and support. Each woman participates in individual and group therapy, has access to basic medical, dental, and legal services, and receives an education as well as job skills training. In addition, survivors are provided life skills training in money management, meal preparation, housekeeping, and personal wellness. Our goal is for each survivor to leave the harbor fully restored so she can return to the community and enjoy a life of sustained independence. Financial gifts provide shelter, food, and clothing various therapies, transportation, medical assessments and medications, tutoring and testing, ID acquisition, legal coordination, and much, much more. If you would like to get involved in the ministry of North Star Initiative, join us online at northstarinitiative.org where you can find more information about how to connect. We are, in fact, uh, a member of a very gracious and supportive community here at St. Paul's, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, all of you, who continue to partner with us in ministry so that we can do what we do here at St. Paul's Church. We're a light for E-Town and beyond. On the screen are some ways that you can partner with us in ministry in this way. If you would like to know more about that, we hope that you'll also reach out to us at stpauls.faith, stpauls.faith, where you can learn more about the ways that you can partner with us through giving. I'd like to enter into a time of prayer now as we say thanks to God for all that he's doing through St. Paul's and in each of our lives. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for all that you give because everything that we have comes directly from you. And Lord, I pray that as we return this portion, Lord, that, that we are able to give back, may it be multiplied several times over so that your work here on earth will continue through your people and Lord, through your church. We lift up these prayers saying the words that you taught us to pray and saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, Thank you that you're a God who communicates to us through your word. And we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to enliven your word in our hearing so that we, by our minds and by our hearts and by our wills, be willing to do as you call us to. We pray, help us to hear your call through your word so that your word becomes alive in our hearing and alive in our subsequent living. We pray this all so that Jesus Christ might be glorified, worshiped, and served and loved in our lives, and that might be apparent to those whom we come in contact with, so that your kingdom might spread and you might receive the glory that is your due. We pray, do that this morning, in Christ's name, amen. Have you ever squeezed into a standing room only playoff game? Or you, have you ever bought tickets to a general admission concert and you've gotten tickets on the ground and you're just surrounded by people? Or have you ever been in a race where you're surrounded by wall-to-wall -wall people as you're waiting, waiting for the starter's pistol to go off? I describe these scenarios because I think in each one of them you got, might get a, a sense of what it feels like being among the crowds that Jesus spoke to. You see, when Jesus ministered, he, he rarely spoke into the quiet of a, of a classroom or, or even a Sunday school class. He was always surrounded by people. There was always energy and lots of people. And in a sense, there was anticipation and excitement. But there also was a little bit of, you know, safety issues. You, you feel like you might get crushed and there's, there's excitement, but there's also warning around you. So much of Jesus' ministry took place in the midst of crowds. And our passage begins and repeats the idea of Christ being surrounded by crowds. We read right at the beginning, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And then later, as we move into the story, it says, so Jesus went along with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. I highlight this backdrop because I think that the randomness, the swirl of activity and ideas and concerns and peoples, all these things, this very chaotic nature of what a crowd is like is a good metaphor for what our lives are like every day. You know, living today, the headlines might change in details each day, but still there's such a swirl of concern and threat and turmoil, you know, whether it be earthquakes in Haiti or hurricanes or flooding or inflation or Afghanistan or COVID cases mounting, individual freedoms, government mandates, all these things make us feel like we're living in the midst of a whirlwind of issues and concerns and realities. And, and besides that, we have to wake up each day with responsibilities and you know, put one foot in front of the other and the people who we take care of this whole swirl of chaos that we call life. It's fitting to think of being in the crowd around Jesus as they're all jostling to hear what he has to say, to see what he might do, to be around this whirlwind of excitement. So let's join him as he makes his way. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. Now, 
I suspect that a synagogue leader stuck out like a sore thumb in the crowds. We, you know, we don't know for sure what the precise makeup and composition of the crowds around Jesus were, but someone like a synagogue leader would have been someone held in high respect in the community, you know, for the authority and the responsibility that he had, and he might be actually well known in the community and highly regarded people may have actually stepped aside to allow him to get to Jesus, to gain access to Jesus as he approached. Everyone was clamoring to get close to Jesus, but the crowds may have parted for him and given him the VIP treatment. And just maybe, did the crowd step aside looking for a fight? Uh, Did they brace themselves for a confrontation? You see, the Jewish... Religious leaders, including synagogue officials, you know, they've not only been critical of Jesus, they've made an official pronouncement about his ministry that he was in cahoots with the devil. He's possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons, declared the Jewish council. Jesus had gained the reputation as one who disregarded the very thing that the religious establishment cared very deeply about. He associated with bad company, he ate with flagrant sinners, and even called some of them to follow him. He didn't train his followers properly or thoroughly, at least by their standards, and his followers did not fast or or honor their time-honored customs. In their estimation, he ran a messy, undisciplined, ragtag group of followers. Will this religiously scrupulous synagogue leader challenge him? Well, all those questions disappear immediately as we read on. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So contrary to the Jerusalem elite who looked down their noses at Jesus, dismissing his very ministry of exorcism, healing, and authoritative teaching, this synagogue leader humbly bows before Jesus, acknowledges Jesus' authority, and assumes the position of a beggar in great need before him. Desperate for his daughter's life, he pleads for Jesus' attention. And the next verse we read is, so Jesus went with him. Now, it's very tempting to take this verse for granted. I mean, a father comes with a need to Jesus, and he responds. Well, of course, isn't that what Jesus does? He responds to needs. Okay, but think about it. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus? The rich young ruler, who should be called the moral rich young ruler who kept every single commandment. I mean, when the disciples saw this guy come to Jesus, they must have thought, what a promising follower. Not only was he moral, he had kept all of the commandments, but he was young, wealthy, and powerful and authoritative. Yet Jesus tells him he lacked something. And as the conversation spells out, the young man is discouraged from following Jesus and he leaves. What about the would-be follower who wanted to bury his parents first? See, Jesus went with Jairus because here's a man who approached him in desperation. And Jesus never turns away those who are desperate, who are wholehearted seekers. Let me just take a step back and say, how many of us thank God for the situations in our lives that make us desperate or that make us aware of our desperation. Let's admit it. If we hadn't been brought to that place in our lives, would we ever have come to Jesus? Would we ever have seen our need for Jesus? But we thank God that we were there and therefore met him. Aware of our need that far outweighs everything else, we look to the one who alone can meet our need. 
Jesus said, blessed are the destitute, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, thank God for situations that force you to turn to Jesus because you've come to an end of yourself. Thank God for bringing us to the point of desperation. And this situation is desperate. It's urgent. There's little time to spare. The Greek phrase that the Father uses is ekotos eche. Eschatos is the word for final or last things, and it literally means this has finality to it. It's a colloquialism for at death's door or sinking fast. Jesus senses the Father's urgency, and he turns immediately to follow him. Now, if Jesus and Jairus had separated from the crowd and made a beeline for Jairus' house, the next part of the story would be all about what happened at Jairus' house. However, crowds followed. We continue reading in Mark chapter 5, verses 24 to 29. Now a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Well, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Okay, so crowds follow. We're not at Jairus' house yet. Crowds follow, and someone else in the crowd has issues. This is really important to, to realize here. What we just read happened secretly without anybody noticing it. See, she didn't approach Jesus. Jesus, she doesn't explain to Jesus what her situation is. Jesus doesn't acknowledge, listen, and then respond to her, no. Her miracle happens without anyone noticing it, quite literally behind Jesus' back. And remember, the synagogue leader's daughter is dying, and there's no time to lose. So, Jesus, what are you going to do? See, as, as we read this story, we might think, Jesus, nobody has witnessed any of this, stay the course. This is a synagogue leader after all. The religious establishment has turned on you. They've accused you. They've branded you as a false teacher, Satan's agent. And here's one who believes in you. This situation could dramatically change how the Jewish leaders and the Jewish nation reacts to your ministry. This could be huge. What's more, it's urgent. But listen to how the story unfolds. In verse 30, we read, At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my clothes? Jesus calls attention to that unsolicited touch. Jesus senses power. He knows a miracle has occurred. But he's missed seeing the person who's been healed. Jesus' abrupt stop and his open-ended question simultaneously surprised the disciples, probably shocked the woman, and to say the least, probably really disappointed Jairus, who wanted no interruptions, to say the least. But the disciples' response is heavily loaded with incredulity and maybe a little bit annoyance. Basically, they say, in 31, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? It's almost as if the disciples want to say, Jesus, you're surrounded by these pressing crowds. Who didn't touch you? When my children were really young, they loved to go in the pool. And we set up one of those little you know, inflatable pools in the backyard which had maybe a foot of water deep. And they would run and they would jump in, you know, landing on their feet, they didn't dive in. But as soon as they went into the water, they'd 
close their eyes and they'd yell, Dad, Dad, my, I got water in my face, I got water in my face. Which meant I had to take a towel, come over and wipe their faces because they didn't feel they could open their eyes. Well, this happened every single time. They jumped in the pool and it splashed. Daddy, you got water in my eyes, you got water in my eyes, water on my face. And I'd, you know, I'd say to try to explain the logic of this. You have to understand. When you jump into water, it's going to splash. Someone's going to get on your face. It's not the end of the world. Just open your eyes. But no, they, it, this happened, I don't know how many years. The pool, and they just would, like, they would go rigid. My, I got water on my face. Go water on my face. That same kind of, like, ridiculous reaction is what I read into the disciples here saying to him, Come on, Jesus, that's a ridiculous question. Who touched me? You see everyone jostling around around you? How, how? Well, as ridiculous a question as it might have been, well, the answer was just as disappointing and maybe as shocking. You see, the identity reveal was an enormous letdown. To put it bluntly, in their minds, this person simply wasn't a person worth the delay. She was not worth stopping for. This was not someone important enough to postpone the synagogue leader's concerns. The person Jesus halted his urgent visit couldn't have been more opposite the synagogue leader. She was a woman, first of all, not a man, and in the first century, you know, Palestine just didn't consider men and women equal. Secondly, she was poor. Remember, she had spent all of her life's earnings on doctors trying to get a cure. So therefore, she was not well-to-do. She also was an outcast, one who had been unclean. She was not a prized and respected contributing member of society. And last of all, her condition rendered her unclean, which meant she was unfit for worship. And we're comparing her to the synagogue leader who was a ritually pure, scrupulous law abider who led worship. Did Jesus jeopardize his great catch? Did he scare away his prize fish? You see, when, when this woman reveals her identity and explains her story, I wonder if the crowd did another step back, not to allow her VIP treatment, but rather to step away so that they didn't catch her uncleanness. Not that her condition was contagious, but her impurity would have rendered everyone else impure. I mean, did she just make them all unclean? Did she contaminate Jesus? Would Jesus step back, would Jairus step away? Once she identifies herself, the disciples may have found Jesus' concern even more ridiculous. Why waste time on such a comparatively worthless person? And why waste precious time when the synagogue's leader's pressing problem is so urgent? Why did Jesus stop? She got what she wanted. She wanted and she preferred to slip away unnoticed. But you see, her remedy was less than what Jesus wanted with her, which was a relationship. And it was a relationship in which she would be known, she would be acknowledged, and she would be treasured. And it would be a relationship in which Jesus was understood. See, God, dispense, God dispensing good gifts like healing is topped by his desire to dispense himself. His stopping gives her value equivalent to any man, any well-to-do person, anyone who is important or highly regarded, anyone who is ritually clean. By Jesus acknowledging that she was healed would be her acceptance back into society. Okay, so we, we all grow up knowing that God is no respecter of persons and we should treat each one equally. And no one would ever out loud say, yeah, but you know, I, I really have a hard time with this 
class of people or this ethnicity or even people who are of this body type or whatever. Or, you know, by, judge them by their looks. No one would ever say that. And yet, I think we all, if we catch ourselves, if we think through what goes on in our minds, we so often will size up people by looking them up and down. Next time you meet a new person, catch yourself to see if you are sizing them up and categorizing them. None of us should do that. But not only that lesson we need to learn over and over again, but we also need to think about how God sees us. You see, because sometimes we feel we need to size ourselves up and be in a good place before God welcomes us back. And that completely misunderstands the grace that God extends to us and the faith that connects us to Jesus. You see, Jesus clarified his relationship to this woman by defining the relationship of you put your faith in me, it's not because you touched me and some kind of magic healed you. You see, the church gets this wrong all the time. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church's uh, accumulated relics. You know, if there was a splinter of the cross, if there, were, there was a, a cloak that this saint wore, and people would come and feel like they got close to God because they touched something tangible. Very often today, we almost work ourselves up into a certain mood or emotion, feeling like, I sense God is with me. I feel his peace, his presence. We're equating God with something tangible, even if it's an emotion. And Jesus is saying, the relationship between me and you is based on faith. It's based on your trust in me. Not, you're even touching me. Not, even... Doubting Thomas is seeing him, but faith and trust in Jesus' person, trust in his good intentions for us, that is what healed this woman. We need to remember that all the time, that it's faith that connects us to Christ. And here's the thing, desperation is good in that it brings us to a place where we sense our need for Jesus but it's from the position of desperation that we look up and connect and see Jesus by faith. See, from the depths of desperation, we look up to our helper in faith. Desperation is great, but all too often we could wallow in the catharsis of loss, of admitting need. Our, our culture is very much into this genuineness and being in touch with your feelings. But Christianity not only calls us to, to be remorseful about what we do wrong, but, from, but looking up, not just experiencing that emotion and contriteness and, and repentance, but looking up to the Savior who can heal us. That's the connection by faith up to him. Not only do we see ourselves clearly, but we see him clearly. We see our need, and we see that in Christ our needs are met. So we realize our need, but Jesus searches for the one who touched him. And he looked around. We looked at Mark 5, 32. He looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. See, thank God for bringing us to the point of desperation. From the depths of desperation, look to your helper in faith. God dispelling good gifts like healing is topped by his desire to dispense himself. And God welcomes everyone, no matter what your state or status. So often people describe the Christian life almost like a roller coaster. 
we fall away and we, we make mistakes. And then, then we, have, we ride the crest of newfound energy and zeal to follow him. But you see, the person who rides that roller coaster, and we all do, we have times of failure and victory. There's no difference in the nearness we are to Christ because we're connected by faith. And it's not our feelings of, okay, Jesus, I come before you because I've been a good boy lately. I, I'm doing well and I'm really obeying you. But rather, even in the time of desperate failures. And these failures might not be huge failures. They may just be admission that, Jesus, the whole day has gone by and I haven't even talked to you once today. That happens. But it's at that time that Jesus is just as close because his promise, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because of faith in his word and his promise, we're connected to Jesus. Faith connects us to our Savior that we need so desperately. Now, Jesus' ridiculous question becomes all the more pronounced when the messengers arrive with bad news of the daughter's death following his delay. But that's next week's sermon. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that in this story we see you responding to those who come to you humbly and desperate. Thank you that it doesn't matter that it was a highly respected religious person with a dire need or a woman who is the exact opposite. Someone who would not have parted the crowds because they would have given her VIP status. A person who realized she had to come from behind sneaking in to get to Jesus but you treated them and welcomed them and gave them what they wanted just the same. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace that is extended to us when we're humble, either in our successes or in our shame. Thank you that your grace allows us to connect to you by faith. And thank you that our faith is put in one who never changes who is always welcoming, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, whom we can count on by faith. We pray, may we more and more seek your presence and enjoy it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now, friends, as we bring our worship to a close, may the grace and peace that surpasses all understanding be with you today and until we meet again. We truly hope that God blesses you throughout this week. You know, we would love to hear from you. If you would like to connect with us to learn about next steps, please send an email to office at stpauls.faith. We would love to know how God is working in your life and how we can partner with you in your journey with him. Additionally, if, if you think someone that you know would benefit from hearing this message, we hope that you'll use the share link below this video and share it with your friends and family. We'd like to invite as many as possible to be a part of this great group that we have here at St. Paul's Church. Amen.